Καλημέρα σε όλους. Good morning. Good morning. How is the snow? It's almost gone. Oh. <laughs> uh, we had a, a very fun uh, 24 hours, a little bit of change there, and now we're back to our um, <laughs> pandemic lifestyle. <laughs> Well, um, hopefully um, one day you'll be able to visit. Um, you know, you're working now on a project uh, that is based here and it's a shame that you can't visit in person. Um, but, you know, uh, it will be nice to cultivate ideas. And I think um, hopefully one day that can happen for, for at least for many people um, in, the, in the studio. Yeah, I'd say I would just introduce you very briefly and then sure. let you. Mihalis mm -hmm. um, has a Bachelor of Arts in History of Art from the University of Michigan and a Master's in Architecture from the University of California at Berkeley. He has worked in New York for the studio of Stefan Jaknitsch Architects. And since 2013, he's been teaching design at the School of Architecture of the University of Patras here in Greece. 2006, he has established AREA, which stands for Architecture Research Athens, with two other architects. I think one is a guest here too, Stiani uh, Lauti and George Mitrujas. Um, exploring the relationship between culture, form, and context, uh, and context uh, the team. I'm sorry, the team's approach actively engages the boundaries between public and private realms. Their theoretical and built work ranges across multiple space, from furniture to urban design, and has been published and exhibited in Greece and in, throughout the world. They have in Europe, Asia, and North America. Their work has been... Um, Sorry, <laughs> I'm really sorry. Um, it's been a very long week. <laughs> the, work, the work has been distinguished among the best Greek buildings and projects of 2013 and 2015 in the Domestomais International Review and has received numerous distinctions in competitions for public and private projects in Greece and abroad. I will just mention a few. They have won the first prize in the architectural competition for 220 housing units in Thessaloniki. The first prize uh, executive in the National Urban Design Competition, Athena Vitesera. They have won honorable mentions in two European and two nominations for the um, EU MIS Awards. Their installation made in Athens was exhibited at the Venice Biennale of 2012 in the Greek Pavilion. And Adocracy Athens at the Onassis Cultural Center 2015 and at the Tomorrow's Exhibition at Le Lieu Unique in Nantes 2019. I've mentioned that Mihalis is, is teaching design in Patras. Um, uh, Stiliani Dauti has also been teaching design there, has also taught design there, and George Mitrujas is teaching design at the University of Thessaly in, in Greece. So. so we are glad that the connection worked despite the snowfall and that we can uh, uh, have a quick insight into your way of working and into your studio. Unfortunately, we can't be there uh, for real, but at least here. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. That's, that's very kind of you. And we always appreciate the opportunity to share our work. Um, and again, if you are ever here, we would be happy to give you a tour of our studio. Um, I, um, I guess I can start now the... Mm -hmm our presentation, I'll do a share screen here and hope that it works. Are we okay? Yeah. Okay. So um, again, thank you for the introduction. Uh, when uh, Yorgos and uh, Stiliani and I met um, we were living and working in New York, and it was um, in 2006 that we decided to move back to Athens. And at the time, uh, Athens to, to us seemed like a very interesting place um, and much less defined than a place like New York. Um, and so part of our 
um, ideas in office was to invest uh, really a lot of energy um, into research, which is why AREA stands for Architecture Research Athens. Um, you know, Athens for us is a kind of laboratory um, to experiment. And I think um, <clears throat> that's uh, um, one reason that uh, some of what you will see today is really research oriented and it's about different ways to um, explore new design methods um, that, that are very much based in the city. So um, our um, title for today is uh, City as Interior. Um, I think that this is an idea that um, is uh, really um, uh, uh, has gained a lot of uh, circulation recently in the world. Um, in Athens in particular, um, which you see here in an aerial photograph, um, the city really is an interior. I'm sure that you've already had um, a degree of introduction to the city by your other um, speakers. Um, if you recall, uh, the Attic Basin um, <clears throat> is enclosed by a circle of mountains uh, going all the way around the city, and then you have the coast to the south, but the actual uh, Athens municipality, which you see highlighted here um, in the light uh, color, um, is quite small compared to the urban sprawl that goes right up to the mountains. So it really operates as a kind of island. Um, uh, and it, in, that, in that sense, it really is uh, disconnected from the coast and it really does function as an interior by itself. So it's very inward looking, very dense, um, with uh, very little um, respite in the form of green space um, and other kinds of uh, planned interruptions into the city fabric. So these um, constitute Athens as a horizontal city as opposed to a vertical city like New York. Um, the horizontality in part uh, owes to the fact that it was developed informally uh, largely from the 50s to the 80s um, through the large influx of the urban population from the rural areas. Uh, and the way that the urban sprawl occurred was through the very uh, small pieces of land, very small plots of land that were developed um, with strict height limits as well so that no uh, building, uh, with few exceptions, uh, would compete uh, with the Acropolis uh, in the center uh, of the city. So uh, that constitutes the horizontal city for us and one that becomes a kind of endless interior. Um, here I'm going, to presenting, I'm going to be presenting to you Athens charting, um, which was our proposal for the um, Athens by four uh, urban um, design competition. Uh, which we won uh, ex equo in uh, 2010. Um, our thinking um, about the city um, in the beginning uh, really um, uh, was defined as a kind of social research into current events. So there's a kind of politics of um, the uh, urban context in Greece, especially at that time, uh, which led us to um, uh, look into the difference between strategy and tactics. Okay, so stra strategies are, uh, 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 to put it um, succinctly, um, planned, officially planned and from the top down. Um, tactics are something that are very much more from their uh, actions that are taken from the ground up, like grassroots um, initiatives um, that are uh, have a different tempora temporality. They occur more spontaneously and they're a kind of more political, if you, if you like, um, reaction to um, uh, whatever uh, the state strategies might be. So um, this is also the years of crisis. Um, as you know, there was a long economic, economic crisis um, in Greece um, for 10 years. And um, this was the first time that uh, grassroots initiatives um, historically occur um, in Greece. So here we have, um, they're called the Atenistas, uh, who mobilized citizens 
to uh, kind of do these guerrilla cleaning um, uh, tactics where they would descend on, an, on the neighborhood and you know, clean it up, remove the chewing gum, fix the storefronts, basically do all of the things that the state had no resources or money to do during the crisis. So people said that we were going to take things into our own hands. Um, another um, notorious instance was the creation of this park in the neighborhood of Exarchia. Um, the the uh, a, a plot of a plot of land that belonged to the city was used for parking, um, and the uh, and was going. Uh, a plot of land that belonged to the city was going to be used for parking um, and uh, the citizens uh, um, uh, without uh, following the, the normal uh, planning uh, routes basically organized and came with jackhammers and other tools to destroy the asphalt and to create a park basically overnight and that became a self-organized um, uh, park um, in the in a very densely inhabited neighborhood in the city center and the municipality um, eventually conceded and uh, because the the opposition was so uh, vehement um, that you know this was uh, uh, the the, the, the um, this space this kind of public space through private initiative initiative was post facto uh, publicly sanctioned and then we have uh, the, um, the uh, neighborhood of Exarchia and the, and the main square where um, the city residents uh, who were finally fed up with the um, unwanted uh, visitors to the public space and um, many of whom are uh, drug users um, and uh, petty criminals uh, came out with megaphones and socially shamed the users out of the space to kind of reclaim their neighborhood space for themselves. And then this example is from the neighborhood of uh, Ayupa de Leimonas, where the, uh, the public um, playground, um, which was used by uh, all residents and open to the public, um, was then locked by certain residents who didn't want their children to be playing with the children of immigrants. So it was a response to the influx of um, immigrants during the crisis. And again, a kind of um, laying of claim to public space. So on the one hand, all of these examples that were in the news kind of uh, indicate um, uh, a way that private initiative can be harnessed um, if properly organized so that instead of having every small um, uh, private group doing whatever they want, there should be some way to use that energy um, uh, as, a, as a resource where other resources are lacking. Um, of course, this also uh, at the same time poses really important questions about public space, like to whom does public space belong? Um, how should public space be planned um, in terms of time um, and who should execute the work and how can that work incorporate a more fluid set of ideas um, without you know, this recourse to um, um, e exclusive intentions or fascist intentions or uh, the abuse of social rights. So uh, for the, back to the urban design competition, um, which was about the unif unification of four urban blocks in a part of the city that we could choose. Um, we chose these four blocks in uh, the neighborhood of Patricia. You can see the, the, the ultra dense fabric of um, basically six story uh, building flats. Um, we, we reacted to the modernist paradigm of the Athens Charter by calling our project Athens Charting. The Athens Charter is, is, uh, was signed by uh, Le Corbusier and the other um, modernist architects and planners at the beginning of the 
uh, well, in the 40s. Um, uh, and it was signed on a boat as it was um, set out from Athens in the Mediterranean by the members of the uh, Siam. And it, um, as you are probably aware, the modernist planning principles of zoning um, were very dominant. And our idea for Athens charting was that we would create a, a fluid um, set of principles uh, that would define how a city could develop over time. Um, and therefore it led to a kind of catalog of actions. Our idea was not to create so much an image or a ready design that would be applied to the city, but more a toolkit. And in this toolkit, you can see that there um, are three, uh, three, three uh, categories from the vertical axis. The vertical axis on the left um, shows that there are three spatial categories. Um, the top row um, are a surface oriented interventions. The middle row are point uh, interventions at single points in the city. And then the bottom row are linear interventions. And each category exists on continuum from left to right from the more ephemeral practices that can be uh, instituted um, overnight and without permanent change um, to ones that gradually require more and more uh, planning and intervention and investment, uh, including the most permanent ones on the right. So catalogs and charts are something that we often use in our work, um, which is both a kind of research um, and here it's also the end product because it's kind of, it's, 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 uh, it takes the place of a design and it offers something that can evolve um, uh, um, over time. At the bottom of the uh, image, you can see the way that uh, the, the four urban blocks, um, between them you have this cross shape that's the new space of intervention. Um, and that's our case study for this uh, proposal. It's a cross-shaped public space and it can be repeated uh, along a linear route so that it begins to connect parts of the city or adjacent neighborhoods. Um, here you can see uh, again the position of that cross. This was the intersection that we chose. Um, we chose it because it's a very representative condition and because it exists along a very long but very narrow um, street called Felice that runs all the way through the center of the city. Uh, so the, um, for us, this uh, public space uh, began uh, again, as I say, through this chart of actions that would develop um, help to develop and cultivate the idea of a changing identity for this neighborhood through ephemeral actions that would then be layered over time through uh, um, the addition of more permanent um, interventions. And a, a key element here is the role of the architect as a design diplomat. So uh, as a participatory process, um, residents would be able to um, uh, to visit uh, the site and to participate in the, the um, uh, application of ideas and the determining of which steps are most appropriate to the neighborhood and which the residents would, would most like. Again, this is a very new and uh, uh, um, down up um, idea. Um, in a, a Greek context where the state was really um, lacking any resources to be able to um, plan for or even care for um, public space. So the idea is that if you are able to somehow um, in cooperation with residents through the design uh, diplomats, uh, allow them to transform space, then public space is somehow owned um, by, by residents. And this is a very important concept for the way that public space is maintained. Um, instead of paying expensive public workers to come and to clean and to um, maintain the vegetation um, or uh, to ensure the, or the, the working order of various uh, 
public fixtures, the idea that residents would learn to adopt their public space and care for it at the same time. Um, here you can see a, a, a kind of totalizing view of this public space, which basically acts as an outdoor room. Um, the outdoor space itself um, exists not only as the streets, which we take over and turn into light circulation and pedestrian streets, but the, this was also about a research into the urban voids. You know, streets are only one void. Um, you can see on one street corner, there's an inset that is a, a, a space of a stoa or a colonnade. Um, other spaces are the party walls, um, the blank party walls, um, which are not allowed to have window openings and you find them throughout the city. So you have a huge vertical surface. And the idea is what can, how can this uh, participate in the image of the city or the functioning of the city or some kind of uh, other, um, in some other way. There are rooftops, which uh, is an under, is, is, is a very, um, it's a very Greek thing and a very uh, Athenian thing, um, but highly underutilized. And there are empty lots as well. So you can kind of, you know, scan the urban environment in three dimensions to find these uh, uh, spaces. So, you know, the, the vertical, vertical party walls um, in our catalog um, were uh, an opportunity for plant growth. Um, some uh, kind of um, low climbing walls, projections, um, other uh, kinds of aesthetic intervention like painted murals. Empty lots here become a kind of um, park with a, a landscape element and a place for people to gather. Um, you know, uh, linear interventions include a, bi a bicycle path. Ephemeral and linear interventions include a street bazaar um, or other street events that can be planned. Um, rooftop interventions can be a game court or other, other kind of um, exterior um, program. And then you see in this image that the, the city itself becomes a kind of neutral um, a neutral mass upon which the interventions act as uh, ephemeral um, elements. This was presented at the Venice Biennale in uh, 2012 in the Greek pavilion, um, which was titled Made in Athens. The, the model itself is interesting. It's um, approximately three meters by two meters, and it's all um, hand drawn with blue ink on white paper. Um, the model itself is a kind of interior um, because it is something that invites the viewer in. Um, you project yourself into the model and because of its large scale, you, be, you participate in the space of the model. Um, the medium here of the representation is also important because it represents a Greece with few resources which is not, nevertheless uh, vibrant and lively. And I think uh, this comes across in the kind of, uh, um, yeah, the liveliness of the model and the life, um, less visible in the photographs, but certainly uh, an, an element there. And the paper is also something that is, um, um, uh, uh, it's a very economical means, of course. So our work is sometimes about how you can do a lot with a little. And I think that in, in an age when architecture is extremely expensive, um, it's very worthwhile to think about the ways that um, it's some, there's an underlying logic that is uh, more important than what you see on the surface and uh, that doesn't necessarily always have to do um, with money. So these are images from the, from the model. Uh, and it's also interesting to us the way that we can uh, both be inspired by the vernacular and change it without the boundary between the two ever being exactly clear. 
Um, around the same time, uh, which was 2010, we were working on this mixed use building uh, in Patricia, which is not far from uh, the site of the Athens by Four competition. Um, the, I'm sure that you've understood what the Greek polykatikia is as a kind of uh, domino frame building um, that can absorb even public uh, programs within uh, the shell, which is basically a shell of private uh, residences, private flats. For us, um, again, looking at the very dense neighborhood, it was a question of how we can fill this very small site um, without simply creating a box. So the L-shaped plan creates a small garden courtyard in the back of the plot, which um, uh, is also continuous with the leftover, the leftover space of the urban plot. Um, this means that the building itself negotiates the relationship of the street to the garden in the back. Uh, the organization of the building um, is not so much the traditional stacking of floors vertically, but it's something that we think of as a sectional facade. So um, in each floor, a certain percentage of the space is given to the more private uh, areas and a certain percentage is given to the more public areas. And then the more public areas act as a bridge uh, through this very porous architecture, uh, these voids that are incorporated into the building and allow the garden to communicate with the street. Um, this is very different from 95% uh, of the buildings in, uh, in the Greek city where you have end-to-end -end balconies uh, covering all of the facades, um, which I'll, I'll return to. So here, outdoor space is incorporated into the volume of the building. And then you have three different typologies of a residential space uh, that occur and, and appear to develop um, from one end uh, to the other laterally. Um, so the facade is uh, this, and you have both these uh, voids in the building, and then you also have these uh, vertical openings uh, with shutters that slide back and forth um, and uh, enliven the image of the building from public space according to their movement. Um, I'll return to those uh, later, but entering the building, you see that the voids carry forth this bright color. The, uh, the color is something that on the one hand marks the more publicly oriented spaces of the building. Um, it also highlights the voids and therefore turns the voids into prisms or solids by themselves. And it's also um, inspired by the colors of the city. If you, if you scrape beneath the dirty surfaces, you often find extremely exuberant uh, colors in the tents um, and in the handrails of uh, some of the older buildings. Um, so th um, this to us is maybe looks very new and striking, but it's also something that comes from the city. There's a lot of varied color. Um, so entering, you, um, you kind of pass by the, the space of the courtyard, um, which carries this color up through the top. Um, and uh, on the first two levels, you have a kind of professional space, um, uh, which can be rented, and then the upper levels are used for as permanent residences. And here you can see on the, on the plan, you have the street at the top. And on the right, you see the, uh, a small space for parking is continuous with the space of the garden in the back. And this is also the side of the building that carries the, the common areas of each private residence, which um, uh, are like bridges between the public space and the space at the back. Uh, and then here you see an outdoor pergola area 
um, adjacent to the um, main living area, again, on the right side. A section through the bridge part of the building. And one of the rooms is, in the, and is an example where you have this, uh, um, this cross circulation space, uh, this two-sided space that's kind of suspended in the air. And then here you have the, um, the narrow um, openings. Um, these are kind of interesting because they, in a way, they hark back to the debate between uh, Le, uh, Le the well-known debate about windows between Le, Le Corbusier and Véran, who were um, uh, the latter of whom was advocating for vertical windows as superior. Um, Le Corbusier, of course, is famous for his horizontal um, strip windows uh, because he claimed that they um, have better light. And uh, of course, Le Corbusier was comparing the, the, the windows of a building to the shutter of a camera um, and analyzing very scientifically the quality of light. And um, Perron was saying that the vertical um, um, windows are actually ideal because they give you a view onto the sky, the horizon, and the ground at the same time. So they're actually more three-dimensional. You have a, a more of a perception of three-dimensional space. And in this case, they're uh, especially um, important because without a balcony on the facade of the building, you really have a very direct view to public space and to the street below, So, which we thought was very important to kind of bring the building closer to the edge uh, with the public space. So again, this is some of the ways that we're thinking about voids and the relationship with the street um, in the Greek uh, city. Um, we'll move now to a couple of examples which are less um, about um, new uh, polykatikias and more about what to do with the old polykatikias. This uh, is a major uh, subject for architects uh, going forward because um, the lifespan of existing buildings um, requires that sooner or later they will either have to be torn down or reused or retrofitted. Um, and uh, of course, lifestyles have changed. The Polikatikia developed as a typology, um, especially during the 60s, um, 50s, 60s, 70s, at a time when it was very much about housing the Greek nuclear family. Um, that these were developer constructions, uh, sometimes with architects, but often with developers themselves who were able by law to build um, you, and, and civil engineers um, erect buildings um, based on a kind of vernacular understanding of, you know, what uh, the basic nuclear family needs, how the layout should um, separate public from private uh, orientation. So we conducted a um, studio at the uh, University of uh, Thessaly um, with the, um, the, the, the master studio was titled Instead. Um, our conception was for a polypartment instead of a, uh, instead of a, a, a polykatikia or a regular um, apartment building. Um, so we began with a, a typical um, shell of a polykatikia as it used to be. Um, and we, we said, what if instead the, the boundaries between adjacent apartments and between the apartment buildings and the public space become more fluid. Um, now that uh, with, the, with the dominance of Airbnb um, throughout Athens as all over the world, there's a new kind of way in which interior space is becoming public. Um, I think this is something that is very ironic because Airbnb is the idea that you somehow inhabit someone's private space, but really what's happening is that the private space is becoming public. And uh, in so many buildings everywhere, um, a huge majority of the flats are actually belong to Airbnb, which means that you have uh, temporary visitors, tourists uh, coming into and out of buildings. Uh, there's kind of a more public character penetrating deeper and deeper into the private space of the apartment flats. So, 
you know, how do these interior spaces relate to the new city and its economic activities? Um, and then how do they relate to each other as well? Um, we, uh, groups of students took uh, floors of the uh, apartment buildings and they reimagined the borders and also the activities uh, importantly, so that reprogramming the Politiquia became a way to engage the boundary between public and private space. Um, the blue uh, shaded elements are mobile uh, or ephemeral pieces and then the, the pink shaded uh, um, elements are permanently placed fixtures. Um, so this became a very interesting, I think, uh, way to explore spatial ideas. Um, the, just to go through a few examples, um, this is a proposal for um, a private uh, residence that has become a store. So the resident is living inside of the store and there is only a very minimal um, um, uh, nucleus that contains the hidden uh, program, but everything else is kind of exposed to the visitor during the day. So um, in order to shop for um, apparel or other items, um, this is the idea of the extended Greek family um, or the, the resident who might cook for various uh, uh, persons in the building. Um, this is, this is something that sometimes occurs, um, both within families and without. It's not something, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of an extreme uh, interpretation of um, uh, something that we might um, imagine already to exist. This is a kind of um, uh, a space for um, clothing, um, which uh, where clothing can be uh, washed, sewn, repaired, and stored. Um, so it's a, it's a different um, uh, kind of ac uh, activity in this residential space. And then this is a, a storage. This is an apartment that has uh, become a storage um, uh, entity. So um, again, there's a kind of archival system. Any domestic space is, is an archive of objects and this here is taken a little bit more to an extreme. So how do you, um, you know, how do you negotiate the, the space there? And then the second example that I'll show um, in terms of the uh, reuse of the Politiquia really has to do with the solidarity networks that developed in Athens uh, during the crisis. So a lot of the abandoned uh, building shelves were re-inhabited um, in order to house these um, um, solidarity networks. Praxis is a non-governmental organization that offers um, a, a network of small shelters, um, especially for the immigrant community um, and also medical care. And it has a mobile unit um, that travels throughout the city to provide HIV testing um, and hepatitis testing. Um, the plan diagram on the lower right is simply to show that they're, they moved into a space and eventually took over more and more of it with this kind of fluid um, uh, expansion idea. And the Politiquia has that kind of neutrality um, in its structure. So uh, it's possible to think about this kind of expansion, um, which mirrors the network of um, the organization itself and the way that it's uh, expanding and shrinking and moving around according to the um, services that it offers. Uh, and here you see the way that they use a lot of their space, both as storage but also as a place, uh, as spaces where visitors um, can come to receive care or to spend the day or um, to allow their children to play. So many visitors are homeless um, to these facilities. There are, um, are small clinics and daycare facilities. So these solidarity networks were interesting for us and important in um, in urban fiction that we created uh, for the Tomorrow's exhibition um, that first uh, was installed in Athens and later traveled to Nantes. 
in France and our, we were asked to come up with a, an installation for this exhibition. And we chose to focus on the neighborhood of Victoria in the center of Athens. It's a former bourgeois uh, neighborhood, very close to the center, um, very close to all of the transportation networks, but which has become uh, downwardly mobile, especially uh, since the last 15 years when the public, large public institutions were carried outside of the city center and a lot of the workforce drained the city center and that created a, a, a vacancy in many of the buildings and the land, uh, the rent prices began to fall and therefore uh, many um, struggling residents began to move in for the cheaper rents. And uh, this square is particularly famous um, for the way in which uh, the, um, uh, at, at, at a certain point in time, it became known uh, to the, the refugees fleeing from the Middle East who would, uh, for those who were able to find their way to Athens, um, many often ended up in the area of Victoria Square because uh, they knew that there were um, solidarity networks ar arising in the neighborhood. So um, it has a very layered um, historical uh, past. One um, government official um, created a controversy, a controversy by claiming that the refugees were sunbathing in the square um, uh, when they arrived, um, obviously having nowhere to go and kind of camping out in, in, in the middle of the square. Um, so there was kind of this idea of a suspended status of refugees and the idea of leisure uh, um, in the square um, and of temporary residence, which we think is very interesting. It's an interesting aspect of the city. Um, and one that really requires some kind of intervention. So we came up with a fiction and the fiction, uh, of course it's imaginary, but it also draws from real observations. Um, so on the one hand, um, you have something that we call the transparent state. Um, it's the official state. It's a place where um, you uh, are protected. Um, you have uh, all of the kind of guarantees of uh, state protection, but in return, you have to give up your right to privacy. So it's a, a, a space of hyper surveillance. And in order to pass into the transparent state where you have a network, um, uh, the, the, um, an ongoing network of official uh, institutions, uh, you have to pass through something called the embassy. And this here is the embassy. So the square has been transformed into a large open air embassy. Um, it plays on the idea that public space is increasingly becoming fortified. Um, if you look at the Eiffel Tower, it's the preeminent public space in Europe, um, who's planned uh, uh, fortification with, with bullet, bulletproof uh, glass screens is indicative of the way that um, public space is becoming more fortified and through private sponsorship, the way that public space is becoming more private. So uh, this is um, the space of, of the embassy in our future Mediterranean city, which is based on uh, Paxton's Crystal Palace. Um, which is appropriate to the, uh, which was built during the reign of Queen uh, Victoria for which the square was named in the 19th century. And it's, uh, it's a labyrinth of prepared uh, experiences. The statue below the square is of uh, Theseus who was the mythological hero con connected to the labyrinth. Um, uh, the installation uh, shows the space of the embassy or the square in the center and then suspended around it are uh, former shells of Polikatikias, which have been inhabited as um, what we call shelters. So in our uh, fiction, uh, a shelter is a former building shell that has again been temporarily um, inhabited. Um, it's because it's been temporarily inhabited, it's a, it's a private space that has become public. 
So in this fiction, we reversed the public and private scenario. So these uh, shelters, as we call them, uh, are um, they offer us all of the flexibility of the Greek uh, city. There are four different examples. Um, there are four because one is uh, based on uh, the idea of the, of the school. So it's a private uh, building which has become uh, a public, a kind of a semi-public uh, educational facility. The, another is a factory. Another is a symposium which takes the place of a church. And another is uh, a heroic medicine uh, cluster which takes the place of a, of a hospital. I don't want to get too bogged down because um, I don't want to go over on time. Um, but just to give a few examples, uh, in the symposium shelter, um, you have all of the functions uh, of uh, public life, which once, which once belonged to the humanities uh, or to religion or had associations of philosophy or poetry. Um, now are kind of housed within this uh, shelter where uh, the spatial dynamic is fluid. Um, residents can come and stay for a while and go. This is the Los Lounge, named for Atlos, um, who claimed that all you need um, in order to appropriate um, or to turn it into a dwelling are five carpets, four for the floors, one for the floor and four for the walls. So it's not so much the idea of a kind of um, truth of materials and recognizing the structure as it is about creating uh, a lining or an interior for temporary habitat and habitation. Um, this is a kind of spiritual well-being embodied by uh, what we call the sacred bar, um, a place where people need to get together in, in order to uh, relieve stress. There's a public kitchen. There's a kind of Dionysian uh, sunbathing terrace. Um, the Greek climate is by itself a resource. And then we have uh, the School of Amateurs. It's a place where people can come to exchange knowledge. So you stay for a while as long as you are able to share your knowledge of your particular talents and abilities. It's another kind of a solidarity network. So it's, it's constantly in flux uh, in the same way that um, Heraclitus would, would claim that you can never step into the same river twice. This is also a kind of open school, the open university idea where uh, participatory practices create an ongoing uh, syllabus that's always changing. Um, and we have the factory of useless objects. Um, you know, um, according to the famous uh, um, um, Dorian, you know, uh, Dorian Gray reference that uh, all art is quite useless. Um, the, the Oscar Wilde um, prologue to Dorian Gray, you have the future museums are actually live in workshops. So you live in a kind of factory and the value of objects uh, is only determined by the extent to which they create meaningful discussion. It's a kind of way to, uh, another way to create uh, the spatial idea of temporality, how something that's temporal and ephemeral also has a spatial implication. And then we have the heroic medicine shelters, which were named for the immigrants to North America in the early part of the 20th century, where uh, immigrants through their own um, uh, sets of traditional practices would care for each other in makeshift clinics um, because healthcare was not really available. So in the future neoliberal state where healthcare will be a luxury, um, there's a different kind of approach to um, uh, the solidarity network and traditional uh, medicinal um, practices. Um, and all of this, of course, is very reminiscent of a dollhouse, um, which is another, uh, it's, it's another inversion, actually. Uh, the dollhouse is a, a Victorian dollhouse like this one from the uh, a German uh, 19th century dollhouse is, the, is a kind of ultimate interior, but it's um, in the Mediterranean context, it's interesting because the um, interior was never really a strongly defined typology of space as it was in Northern Europe. 
uh, the kind of strongest um, spatial precedents in the Mediterranean tend to be outdoor spaces because the climate is one that induces the, the, the um, development of outdoor typology. So again, for us, how an interior can also participate in an exterior is an interesting idea from a Mediterranean perspective. Um, quickly, and then I'll go to our final project um, about the inhabitation of um, uh, building uh, frames. Uh, this project is in the neighborhood of Tavros. It's in the west of the Athens. Um, it was commissioned by uh, a curatorial team called Locus Athens. Um, they asked us to design a community art space. Um, this is a neighborhood with lots of social housing, slightly different context than the regular Greek polykatikia. Social housing in Greece tends to be old, there's not very much new, and it tends to be uh, the, now that those neighborhoods tend to be disadvantaged. This is the post-industrial building for our community art space. It's a shell or a frame for which uh, one major intervention, other than renovating the space itself, was the creation of this mobile uh, unit that could uh, carry different functions. It's a large uh, steel construction with a perimeter curtain um, that could be used by social groups in different ways, either as an open work workshop, uh, a closed office, an element in a, an exhibition. Um, it's able to move around the space here you see it uh, before the opening. It's a kind of suspended uh, work surface on wheels. It's both an interior and part of a larger interior. Um, here a performance, it acts as a part of a backdrop that supports a performance, performance art, performance piece. Uh, this is an exhibition uh, staged in the space. Uh, there are talks that occur with invited speakers. The positioning of the of this unit sort of uh, um, offers many flexible. It's 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 a flexible response to a space that has to do very many things, um, and it even you can project from it onto walls for video projections and and artwork um, of that nature. Um, and then the second project that we did for uh, the same curatorial team of Locus Athens was in the neighborhood of Egaleon, um, also in the west of, to the west of Athens. Uh, the 639 block, which you see in the lower part, it's four uh, social housing um, buildings that encircle a square courtyard. This was a, a very, it was an old community of Turkish uh, uh, refugees in the, in, in the, in the 10s and 20s, in the 20s rather, in this case, the uh, refugees from Turkey in the area of, um, well, anyway, I, I won't get too much into detail, um, settled in this part of Athens. So it's an old community, but then the, 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 the housing blocks are um, very run down and over the years the atomization and individualization of the units has seems to have um, displaced any sense of community um, or public space that once existed. So we wanted to create a conversation about the public space with residents. So we created a large scale model, which was again a kind of catalog of options, which was a tool for us to be able to um, uh, actually uh, have conversations with residents who might otherwise not be willing to really engage in dialogue, either with us or with each other. So um, different spatial interventions were um, presented um, at a public event where residents were then able to come and reconfigure the public space using these pieces um, in order to help them discuss the values of uh, and their priorities uh, for 
um, the reclaiming of public public space, both in terms of uh, the kinds of stasis or inhabitation that public space should uh, foster, um, whether it's whether it's just circulation or whether it's also as a form of uh, leisure or rest, the degree of planting, the type and variety of surfaces and other small structures were all part of this uh, experiment in um, uh, a participatory design around uh, public space. And, uh, and uh, participants left with uh, Polaroids of their particip participation. Um, so um, again, you kind of have this kind of shifting um, dialogue or way that you can uh, project different scenarios onto public space, which are not always meant as literal um, compositional um, uh, projections, but rather as a way of working. So th this is a, a way that, you know, you have to be able to try things out, even if it's in the space of the city or a public space, you have to be able in some way uh, to, um, to try things. And one of the ways we do that is with models. Um, the mechanism is often a catalog. And uh, in as much as it's not private space, uh, one would hope that there's some kind of mechanism for, uh, for public uh, interaction at the same time. So I'll show you our last project here. Um, this uh, project, um, it's a house um, for a, a businesswoman and her adult son. It's on the island of Salamina or Salamis. Um, you may recognize the name from the famous naval battle of uh, Salamis, um, I believe in, in approximately 480 BC um, against the Persians. Uh, it's a very interesting place. I think it's, you know, this is an important project, even though we're talking about the city as interior. I think that um, the city as interior also, um, it implies that there's an exterior. Um, but, you know, what exterior is that? Um, I, I think it goes without saying that the countryside in relation to the city can no longer be simplified as a kind of exterior. Um, Salamina is a very interesting place geographically because it's also, it's the closest island to Athens and it's almost connected geographically. So you can see in this uh, photo, this is a, a historical photo. Um, it's from the 50s, but it's, but it gives you a sense of the geography. Uh, the main difference is that the, the, the areas have been covered by um, Polikatikies instead of some of the smaller shacks that you see, but um, here we're in Perama across, we're on the mainland looking at Salamina in the distance. Um, it has a very um, uh, oddly shaped water channel that separates it from the mainland. Uh, Perama that we're in and also Salamina are famous for their shipyards, shipbuilding. Um, it's a very industrial zone uh, of the city. It's almost, Salamina is almost an extension of the city. Um, it's, it, it's, not a, it's not a typical island, a Greek island um, in the kind of cliche sense. Um, many of the workers in the dockyards here in this industrial zone lived in small ad hoc houses in Salamina and commute every day back and forth. And today people continue to commute um, uh, back and forth to the city on a daily basis. Um, you enter a ferry and the ferry, you don't even have to exit your car. You sit in the ferry and the ferry uh, carries you across. And then uh, the ferry has a a hatch for the automobiles, both in the front and the back. So it's a straight line and you exit and you're in Salamina. So it's almost really the kind of um, social economic extension of the city. Um, so I think that here it's interesting um, to think about, um, you know, where does the city end? Is there really an exterior anymore or is there not? Um, it, given the condition of urban sprawl, and how can uh, architecture mediate uh, the relationship between the idea of an interior and an exterior? So this is still a house that's meant as a weekend house um, 
for the re a resident of, uh, like I said before, the residents of Athens. Um, on the upper left here, you see again, the, the dark shade is the island of Salamina and the medium shade is the uh, greater metropolitan region of Athens. In the middle here of our site plan, you see the, the house. Um, it's on a network of streets with all of the uh, municipal infrastructure above ground. Um, some of the, most of these streets were opened uh, before there was a roadmap and very narrow streets, uh, which were dirt roads. And then after the settlement, the municipality would put down the asphalt for the street um, and install the lines. Um, that most of the houses are extremely informal and they're defined through their additive uh, uh, structural logic. So spaces were added either on top or uh, further out from the initial uh, shell of the building to make more space as the, as the uh, needs of the family continue to change over time. And then the second thing that's uh, interesting is the way that most houses, uh, the way that they occupy the, the garden or the courtyard. So this is a house where virtually everything happens outside. Uh, you have the, it's a where you sit, the place where you uh, prepare food outside. Sometimes you cook outside. Um, it's a uh, space for relaxation, of course. You can watch television outside. It's a very Greek thing. Or um, you can, uh, you know, you have you, your well-cultivated gardens. It's basically a, a place to spend a day. And of course, it's a microclimate. Uh, you see the, the fan here on the ceiling. Uh, you know, uh, if you don't have money for air conditioning, then why not enjoy the perfect climate by sitting outside in the space of the garden? So for us, the design process was really about um, an initial, very open process of, um, uh, of brainstorming where we make small models and then kind of uh, discuss the qualities of each. And sometimes this process goes back and forth and one model will influence another model. Uh, and it happens to be the case that the model on the lower right is the one that was closest to the one to the plan that moved forward, which was this, the two very solid wings um, along the edges of the plot. The edges of the plot you can see in pencil um, on the wood base to the left and to the right. So the house is touching the edges of the plot on both sides. And then in the front, there's a large gate and in the back, there's a large gate. Um, and this creates a large square courtyard in the middle of the house. The private spaces are uh, on, in the two wings inside the solid walls, and then everything in the middle is uh, perceived as a single courtyard uh, containing two glass boxes, which are the main living quarters during the day. And those glass boxes that are in the courtyard have sliding doors, sliding frames that open in various configurations um, so that essentially the main living space can become an extension of the exterior space, like outdoor rooms. So uh, in the plan, you can see that there's, this was an existing, uh, a, a very old olive tree. And here we have an old well. Those were the two, uh, permanent fixtures of the land plot. Um, so the strategy of designing the building as a series of voids, um, one thing that it was able to do was to create, was to accommodate these found elements in very odd places in the, in the land plot. Another thing that it did was um, to uh, cultivate a space that is both private but out, outdoor, an open room. Uh, we're coming from Athens, all you needed to do was to come home and uh, seclude yourself in the courtyard uh, and enjoy the microclimate. 
uh, as a space of relaxation before heading back into the city. So it's in a way, it's a way to leave everything behind in the city and, uh, um, and enjoy this very minimal uh, kind of space. Uh, and more importantly, as a tectonic uh, uh, idea, it, um, it does the opposite of the houses in the area, which we said were kind of an added and additive logic and develop prosthetically over time. So here it's more that we start with a sing single solid and subtract from that in order to create the voids and the courtyards of, this, of, the, of the house. And uh, you can see the way on the left, you can see the way that the sliding doors open uh, in a way that organizes the circulation in, in various ways. And then uh, you can see as well that there's a there is a roof terrace that's part you know which you can see on top. It's also an observation from the vernacular, if you want to call it, uh, architecture of the neighboring houses, which uh, utilize uh, even the roof space as a as a valuable um, spatial resource. Um, and then here on the right, you can see the main entry from the street and on the left, the main entry gate. And inside you see the first courtyard uh, and the main living area. And uh, it, you see the way that it's a continuation of outdoor space. The materiality here plays on the context of the post-industrial shipyards, uh, which are very, very little of, 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 of which are functioning today. So the metal, there, there's a, there are thick exterior walls and then uh, inside the central courtyard, these two glass cubes that I referenced are a, a, a steel construction. Um, with an accessible roof. So the, the vocabulary of metal, um, painted metal and rust are part of the house and the materiality and their, their, their uh, reading of the context. And here on the left, you see the courtyard with the olive tree. Um, and here you see the uh, uh, a private courtyard only accessible from the private space and through a separate secondary entry to a, a, the existing well. All of these houses are like a, a microcosm. This one as well is designed as a microcosm because it was very common for each house to have a well. Uh, the, the threshold from the main uh, common space to the private wings is separated from the floor so you have one step, it's, it's a way to articulate the difference between within the house, between private and public space. Uh, and then uh, going back to our ferries, uh, the roof deck is somehow similar to the experience of the ferry deck. Uh, when you go up, when you exit your car and go up onto the deck and you can have a a sense of the surrounding geography, and the same is, is true here in this uh, in in our in the Salamis house, and uh, and also the way that you drive into the ferry and exit the ferry through these large hatches is somehow similar to the way that you have this large rusted uh, oxidized steel uh, gate that creates a, a connection between the outside world. Uh, even though you're already out. So um, I think that this ambiguity uh, between what is inside and what is outside is interesting. Uh, and also what is urban and what is not urban is also uh, interesting. So I hope that these, um, I'm sorry to be running slightly late, um, we're finished though. Um, so I hope that these can give you a little bit some um, interesting subjects to think about uh, in terms of the Greek context and some different ways to design here. So th thank you very much. Great, thank you very much. Okay. Do, do we have time for questions? Um, Mihaly, do you have time? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yes, for me, that's fine. Uh, okay. for, yes, of course. Sorry, I thought uh, I know uh, that you have a program, so I didn't want to answer prematurely. Maybe there are some questions, students. Um, I was just wondering, you showed us um, a project at the beginning of your um, presentation with these four blocks. Um, yes. I was just wondering, um, how do Greek people, um, are they open to projects like this? Because I think it's mm. um, quite different to their normal living, um, normal living style and it's quite modern. And I just thought, how do they, how do they think about that? Uh, so are you talking about this project, which was the unification of four blocks? Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah, I think that, um, well, if you talk about, uh, if you talk about um, individual Greeks, yes, there's a very strong um, cultural inclination to doing everything outside on the street. Um, so that's, you know, that, that, that exists less probably now than in the past, but, you know, the uh, transition from the agricultural to an urban uh, culture was extremely recent in Greece um, in the starting in the 50s more um, so uh, that aside what's interesting is that when we won this project we took it to the municipality and they thought we were crazy um, they just thought that how is this going to work and you know the idea of participation and there must be a political motive behind your However, the municipality finally has come around, and now the idea that the their you know citizen groups can um, uh, can find some resources and kinds of support. You know, you need you can never go very far. A, a grassroots movement can never go very far if it doesn't have some kind of support. You know, so our idea here is that an architect can be the appropriate professional to connect you know, the, the, the planning regulations and the municipal kind of permit processes and whatever else you need, um, or even just the simple licenses or the communication of what really um, is desired to happen on the ground um, with the wishes of um, with uh, local residents. So mm -hmm. now I think it's, there's, there's come some kind of framework and we were part of a, we were part of, we were invited to, um, uh, make the open call for uh, small sums of money that were given by the municipality. This, uh, um, this is called uh, Polis Squared. Um, it was a municipal initiative to give uh, between two and 5,000 euros to uh, groups of residents who wanted to intervene by uh, adding a, a green space to their building in a way that would affect the, the microclimate on the street. Um, this was this was something that occurred uh, a couple years ago. So it's interesting to see that now it's finally kicked in, but but then it, it didn't uh, go very far, unfortunately. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. But this is very interesting because this week we heard thesis that Greek people don't actually care about public space, you have uh, refrigerators and balconies, you don't care what your neighbors see, but you care more about your private space, which is really a very private business. But I think the project proved that Greek mentality is changing, that people would actually like to care about the public space, but yeah. maybe the culture is not yet there, or like the education, the, <laughs> I don't know. Well, it's, I mean, I think that both points are valid. I think that the key is that um, if public space is not planned in the right way, it is easily subject to abuse um, or indifference. So yes, it's a very, Athens is often a very harsh city. Um, that's why a lot of times people use their balconies to close themselves in. Um, however, uh, there are kind of you can you can trace contradictory movements and given the opportunity to make a better public space of course people want a better public space everyone agrees that you know um parts of the city are ugly or are 
uh, not very friendly to the pedestrian or not green enough. So there, you know, people, uh, I think, uh, very much want to have the right uh, kind, um, but there's also a, a mistrust of, uh, you know, uh, uh, the po political motives or about the way that projects are executed or about, you know, the way that the money is used. Now we had a, um, uh, the, 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 the current government um, uh, uh, installed these temporary planters throughout the city center um, uh, in Panepistimiu and in the Sindagman. And it was a kind of, it was well intentioned, but it was so poorly planned and communicated that it didn't have any support because they, they planted trees next to existing trees. And they created benches in places that are almost in the middle of traffic where no one would want to sit. So, you know, it's important to distinguish between opposition to a, a poor project and support for something that could be better. So I, I think that that's that's kind of the way the way the way we see that we see it. You know, I think that the inward turning is more of a defense. You know, it's not like, um, anyway, I, I guess I'll just leave it at that. It's more of a defense rather than I think a deeply rooted cultural tendency. No, that, that's true. The distrust is of, mm. of the motives is, is always there, unfortunately, mm. sometimes mm. So it's justified, yeah. Mm. More questions? Yeah, maybe. Um, I think it's very interesting to see um, the projects you do are from very small ideas, small structures to big development and uh, uh, buildings. So, but how, how much do these ephemeral interventions or these uh, proposals for temporary use of space or the exhibition influence your work of design uh, in the architecture field, like in the real buildings? Yeah, well, we do, you know, um, I think that the, you know, the ephemeral work is by nature a kind of smaller scale. The community art space in Favros that we showed was kind of one way in which a structure was, you know, um, conceived in the language of, uh, uh, a catalog of different functions. You know, I think that's an important way to think about architectural space is how one thing can perform in many different ways. We've done exhibitions too, where that has been important. Like we did an outdoor exhibition in a, um, the Agriculture University of Greece, where we, we created a series of um, landmark signs that led the, the visitor through, you know, the the, these gardens um, uh, and open spaces. So th those acted also as like a collection of, um, of you know, signage, what can signage do and how can that also tell you something about the climate? You know, that was a topic there. Um, I think the ephemeral actions are, um, you know, they're, it, the, it's, it's interesting for us to think about what are their limits? There has been a lot, not only in Greece, but also in Europe of, uh, of kind of grassroots thinking in recent years. And yes, it's a response to the crisis. But as I alluded to before, you always have to have a kind of um, official support or else they can't go very far. Um, but, you know, so I think that that's one thing that was kind of a learning process for us as well. Like how, you know, the, how, how useful is it really to design another set of wood boxes on the street that are going to, you know, have a limited lifespan? So I, I think there's still questions that are worth considering, however, because you can't expect architecture always to be reinforced concrete or to be something that is expensive and permanent. And part of, you know, any 
large scale development project is also a project of uh, public relations. So the way that you engage uh, a neighborhood is extremely important, you know, for all kinds of legal reasons uh, as well. So I think th that's in every project. And I, you know, I think that also um, we live in a time where, uh, as alluded to, we don't have a nuclear family. We have all kinds of different residences, you know, they, people create, people commission us for their, their house and they're not sure yet if they wanna live there or if they wanna rent it or if they're gonna sell it in a while or if they're just, you know, if they're gonna invite, invite their children and their grandchildren to stay there. So you have all of these kinds of, you know, ideas of um, flexibility that are very difficult to accommodate. So, so the idea of something that's ephemeral it should really be, you know, it's not just a kind of urban design strategy, but it's in architecture and everything that you design, because you kind of have to envision the way that something can happen and then go away when people want something else. So I think that the idea of ephemerality is actually very close to the idea of neutral space. Um, you know, the, the building shells that we talk about, um, the way that you figure your inter intervention is having a, a built ground, um, the changing functions there are, you know, the, the idea of neutrality, uh, which is very close to architectural abstraction, even the idea of the solid and the void that was in the last project that I showed is the idea of neutral space and the way that it can uh, act as a, as, a, as a structure for things to come. So I think that that goes together with ephemerality. Interesting to think of a neutral space, but with a, uh, a soul or a, uh, a quality you would like to live in yeah. or use it. Yeah, we we exported some of ideas um, from uh, from the from Athens to a, a social housing uh, project in Nuremberg that we won an award for and that was interesting too because um the brief there for for housing in much of northern europe as well really increasingly requires these kinds of um uh balcony spaces there's a lot of you know which is not something that's a traditional part of northern architecture uh the, or uh private garden spaces rooftops it's very much something that is sought after and um, I think that that's interesting because from our perspective that's a kind of export of Mediterranean ideas to a kind of living space in the north and I think that that you know in that case I think that um, I would have shown it but I there is an issue of time so uh, the I think that the idea of a void space uh, is not only something that allows the ephemeral to take place, but then it's also about appropriation. You know, how you need, you need to kind of have a, a you can make your own through, that's part of the ephemeral is the way that you occupy. Uh, so, <clears throat> you know, whether it's the, the thresholds of Hertzberger to his, uh, you know, some of his apartment projects that are well known, um, where you leave your things on in this, in between, threshold space between your inside space and the public space of the stairwell, um, or whether it's uh, uh, some other kind of version, I think, you know, that's uh, the space of appropriation is, uh, is very important and especially in um, public housing. And I think that the, the interesting thing about the public housing is that if you design the space well, I think, you know, all these interventions in the shell of the building, like in some of the photographs that I showed of the public housing in Egalio, um, they, the housing itself may look abused, like everyone is painting their dwelling a different color or using a different material to kind of create something on the facade. I think that, you know, the architecture has to be able to accommodate some kind of appropriation. And I think a, a properly planned shell um, or is, is one thing that lets you do that. Uh, and in a city, you know, a city that gives you an appropriate, the interior is your, is your opportunity to appropriate in a way, you know, that's one way that you can define an interior. Uh, like uh, like the Los Lounge that we showed in the Tomorrow's exhibition, the, the idea that you hang
designing these carpets. It's the act of appropriation, which is both, you know, it's ephemeral. And I think that it's, it's, uh, the first step is, is, is the, is a kind of uh, neutral shell. So those things play off each other. And I think that it's interesting to, as a design concept to kind of have that in your, in your, um, uh, be part of your process in a way. And it's economic too, because sometimes with our projects, mm -hmm. you have uh, certain things that can happen now. And even when your client says that they're going to, they say yes to everything, by the time you're done with a project, sometimes you hear a few no's. So you have to be able to kind of like, you know, um, create this system of hierarchies and priority so that you have certain things that are essential to the project and some things leave or you know it's it's important in that aspect as well to think about uh, the layers in your in your project i hope that's not long-winded i can stop now if you if you like <laughs> that's perfect so we take this as a task for no, uh, next projects to create ephemeral neutral um spaces which allow the, the uh, residents to uh, bring their own ideas inside, their own identity. Great. Any other questions or should we stop now? Just the last remark, because yesterday we talked about the houses, the old Athenian houses, the Ables. Mm -hmm. When I saw your house in Salamina, I thought, wow, okay, it's the same typology. It's a very ancient typology, which is very typically Mediterranean. And, but it functions ideally in this climate and in the way we live. So I don't know if it was, a, if you studied this kind of typology or if it was uh, instinctively done because we live in Greece, you live in Greece, you know, the climate. But for me, it was amazing to see after yesterday to see this typology again in a modern um, expression. Mm. I don't know which came for us first, the the cart or the horse, but it's something that we're very excited about. And I think, you know, um, we incorporate some kind of courtyard, either horizontal or vertical into almost everything. Uh, so yes, it, you know, I think that's something. We, as architects, a, we often daydream about our own inspirations and the things that interest us. And I think it's very important to uh, have fun with your projects and also to project yourself into them. You know, what are the kind of spatial experiences that you enjoy? I think it's the first key to a successful project. You know, uh, it's, it's, it's dangerous to be too distant in architect where all you're doing is um, counting and measuring and planning. Uh, and, and, and using an artificial um, a, a kind of aesthetic uh, uh, value um, in some way. So I think that for us, it's very much about embodied experience, you know, and the kind of exploration in the space that you enjoy and kind of how exciting or sensual even you feel that the space will be. So I think that that's an important um, element to carry forward. So uh, thanks again. Um, we're always available if you have any follow-up questions or you know, um, um, if you would like any um, critics for your final projects. So um, <laughs> it was a pleasure to be able Perfect. to meet you uh, <laughs> and to be here and to share our work. So th thanks again very much. Thank you very much. We are looking forward to meet your projects in real Hope Great. <laughs> Let us know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Και εμείς ευχαριστούμε πολύ. Καλή επιτυχία. We wish you success in your in your project in your projects. <laughs>